but I think we should. It's a small group and uh, in, an informal group. So before I introduce him, let me just say that a, a technical comment, and that is that after the lecture and after the question and answer period, we're going to have a reception for Mr. Todd. And everybody in the audience is invited to stay and have some cookies and coffee or punch. So please stay and visit with Mr. Tobbs when he's finished with his lecture and uh, with each other. OK, now, uh, um, our speaker today is Gary Tobbs, who's a science writer from New York. Uh, he has a degree from Harvard in physics, a degree from Stanford in engineering, and a degree from uh, Columbia in journalism. So his scientific background is, is broad and deep. And uh, he's the author of a number of articles in popular magazines, such as The Atlantic and um, Discover Magazine, and also in scholarly journals such as Science Magazine. He's the author of a book uh, called Nobel Dreams, which was published in 1987. And this is about the 1985 Nobel Prize, which was awarded to Carlo Rubia and Simon Vandermeer for the discovery of the W and Z particles at CERN. This is, I'm sure that all Nobel Prizes are a big deal, especially to the recipient. But this was one of the more brilliant of the Nobel Prizes because the W and Zs are critical particles in electroweak theory. And electro, electroweak theory is, a, is what we consider to be our most sophisticated modern theory of the structure of the universe. So this was a, a very important Nobel Prize. And this is the story. I think it's okay now? Not yet. Not yet, I don't think. So, so this was an important Nobel Prize. And it was interesting also because it was one of the first of the really large collaborations. So what Mr. Tobbs did in his, in his first book, Nobel Dreams, was to actually go and live inside this collaboration and find out how very large, modern, big science experiments are done. So there's a tremendous amount of sociology of science in this book, and it's extremely entertaining, as well as a very fine discussion of the physics involved. Now, in his second book, which we're going to hear about tonight, uh, which I have not yet read, it's called uh, Bad Science, the Short Life in Weird Times, a Cold okay. Fusion. And as I, as I said to him earlier, your first book is really a triumphal book. And so we'll let him tell us how he feels about his second book. Mr. Todd. Well, that's about as the most technical this night's going to get. This is just okay. This is what my lecture used to be called back before I gave it to an audience that included my family and they fell asleep. Um, I just put it up because I'm a journalist and I write about science and sometimes scientists have trouble dealing with this and I gave a lecture at a uh, the Gordon conference, it's a very exclusive conference held in New Hampshire every year and they don't even allow journalists in, let alone have them lecture and so when I put up this as a topic they listed it as cold fusion dilution is the better part of grammar. So they assumed it had to be for chemistry. <laughs> The other beginning note is, in order to do my book, I wrote this book, it took me three years. I thought it would take me nine months. It's a slight underestimation. In the process of doing this, I interviewed 260-some scientists. And now I lecture on it. And wherever I go, I meet physicists who want to tell me what really happened, because they're sure they know and I don't. So I also put up a list of the people I interviewed. So you get an idea of what like 260 people look like. <laughs> and then I tell these guys that I know what happened. OK. Now to refresh your memory, cold fusion, that's, that's the remaining in the 260. This was a Wall Street Journal article of March 24th, 1989. Front page, two scientists claim breakthrough in quest for fusion energy. And these two fellows at the University of Utah, Stan Pons and Martin Fleischman, claimed that they could essentially take the power of a hydrogen bomb, nuclear fusion, and control it, and do it with batteries and plating wire and a glass of water. Okay? This is a uh, 
the picture of a cold fusion reactor, a la Sam Pons and Martin Fleischmann. This was actually drawn by them, and it looks very impressive, and they made it look very impressive. But basically, is it, it's, it's a glass filled with what's called heavy water, which is a kind of water, and it's got a couple of electrodes in it. This wire that crisscrosses an electrode, this thing coming down is an electrode, and they plug it into the wall. So essentially what you've got is a glass of water plugged into the wall with two electrodes in it, and they claim that you could get nuclear fusion out of this. Now, three years later, what I'm going to explain to you, basically, is what happened to nuclear fusion. But to understand just a little bit about the weirdness of it, last October there was the third international conference on cold fusion held in Japan. This was a summary of the conference. And basically, you can get the hint from the last chapter, it says, last paragraph says, cold fusion will become one of the most important subjects of science, and it's not a matter to be studied by one single enterprise or nation. It will become the greatest asset as an eventual energy for mankind to be shared among the world. It sounds very impressive. This is a list of the countries that participated in the third international conference on cold fusion. The number of people, and there were 300 scientists and business people there. And cold fusion is still, it's very viable science. When people are doing it, they're lobbying Congress for funding. Uh, Canadians recently did a CBC television show about how real cold fusion is. And the amusing thing about it is cold fusion phenomenon is non-existent. Okay? It's, it's, and that's what I'm going to explain to you. There's no such thing as cold fusion. It never has been, never will be. So how did these people discover it? It was on the front page of the newspapers. Um, and now people are still doing it, and all 300 of those people say I'm crazy, including the fellow who drew up this diagram, whose book I stole from. This is a primer on fusion. Uh, two kinds of nuclear energy we're aware of, nuclear fission, where you take a huge atom like uranium and it splits apart into two equally, almost uh, two very radioactive elements, and they give off energy in the process, and you have nuclear fission, Nuclear fusion, you take two small, very small atoms, uh, protons and the hydrogen atoms, which are one proton, or deuteron, which is a heavy form of hydrogen, which is a proton and a neutron, and you fuse them together, and in the process you get more energy out. Uh, and as a la Einstein equals mc squared, and energy is the mass times the speed of light squared, and because the final end product is not as heavy as the two original products, what's released is, is energy. This is like the basic primer of nuclear fusion. Uh, it takes place in the sun. It takes place under extraordinary heat and power. And the reason being, I've driven it. These are my favorite charts here. Fusion forces at work and fusion facts. Um, if you start off with the deuteron, which are one, one proton and one neutron, uh, they're both positively charged, so they repel each other by electromagnetism, and they attract each other by the strong force. And the strong force is very strong, but it's very, very short range. So you've got these two things that, from far apart, are repelling each other and don't want to get together and close together. If they get close enough, the strong force will take over and pull them together and they'll fuse. So what happens in the sun is you've got extraordinary heat and pressure, and this thing is zinging around. And when they smash into each other, there's enough energy there to push them close enough to the strong force to fuse them together. So how close do they have to get to fuse? And the answer is, <laughs> enough of this. Don't read any farther than mine. The answer is 0 0.0001 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So they have to get 0 0.0001 billionth of a meter together to fuse, OK? How close is this? And the answer is very close. Okay, and deuterium gas, which is D2, which is two of these deuterons locked together, uh, they're separated by a distance of 0 0.074 nanometers, which you can see is about 740 times this distance. And in a palladium lattice, a la cold fusion, I forgot to explain what cold fusion is, just because I'm operating on full stomach, um, how this thing works. back to cold fusion. You've got water, you've got a palladium electrode and a platinum electrode. You put a current in and the heavy water, which is made of deuterium and hydrogen, is breaks up 
and the deuterium is sucked into the palladium lattice, and Pons and Fleischmann theorize that in this palladium lattice, you get such extraordinary pressure that you can push it together to that 0 0.0001 nanometers, okay, and you get fusion. Unfortunately, in deuterium gas, it's 0 0.074 nanometers, and in a palladium lattice, a la cold fusion, the deuterons are separated by approximately 0 0.3 nanometers, which is four times greater than the separation of D2 gas and 30,000 times greater than the separation of that for fusion. So Stan Pons and Martin Fleischmann, our friends from Utah, were saying that you get fusion, but what's a known fact is that once you get the deuterons inside the palladium lattice, they're still 30,000 times greater than the separation necessary. This, by the way, is basic nuclear physics, which is very well established. Okay, so how likely does fusion occur under these circumstances in this palladium lattice? The answer is not very. The probability of two deuterons fusing spontaneously when separated by a distance equal to 0 0.074 nanometers, which is the distance they're at in deuterium gas, is 10 to the minus 64 fusions per second per molecule. Okay, so this was a calculation done by a fellow at Caltech, and what I'm saying is in deuterium gas, using everything we know about nuclear fusion, if you just expected these things to fuse spontaneously, you would get this number, which I'll explain in a second, and the deuterons sit closer together in deuterium gas than they do in a palladium lattice. So what does this mean, this number, 10 to the minus 64 per second? It means if the sun was made entirely out of deuterium gas, there would be one fusion event per year. Okay, so how does this fusion rate have to increase to explain Pons and Fleischmann's results? Pons and Fleischmann claimed that they were getting a noticeable amount of nuclear energy out of these cells, and the answer is a lot. The cold fusion cells would have to generate 10 to the 12 fusions per second, which roughly is blah, 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 blah. The answer is that requires an enhancement of 54 of this magnitude. So what I've given you in this short course in nuclear physics is the fact that what Pons and Fleischmann were claiming was 54 orders of magnitude greater than what you could explain by everything we know about nuclear physics, okay? Still more fusion facts. How big is 54 orders of magnitude? The answer is very big, okay? First of all, there's a number, except in the billion, which is kind of meaningless, but you might want to know that there is a number, that it's 54 orders of magnitude. That's, by the way, 10 followed by 53 zeros. If you have a really good dictionary, like an old Webster's, you'll find that. Um, not under a set of decillion, but under numbers. Okay, the difference between the diameter of a proton, a very small thing, and the diameter of the universe is only 41 orders of magnitude. Okay, to give you an idea how big 54 orders of magnitude is, the difference between the speed of a snail and the speed of light is only 12 to 13 orders of magnitude, depending on the snail. <laughs> I was assuming that they're probably like South African snails, much faster, the same way they have big worms. Okay, so why did Pons and Fleischmann believe that they had induced nuclear fusion in their cell, theoretically speaking? Because we're now working, you know, you've got these two scientists, reputable scientists, they throw a press conference, they're backed by the University of Utah and the press, and they're claiming something that's 54 orders of magnitude away from everything we know about nuclear physics. So why did they believe it? They believed that the pressure induced inside the palladium was 10 to the 27th atmosphere. They said this and they wrote this. It's a billion, billion, billion times the atmospheric pressure of the Earth's surface, okay? It's 10 million, billion times greater than the pressure at the sun, the center of the sun. Don't read this. Okay. What they did is they took a, they had to figure out something called the fugacity of the gas inside the deuterium. I never spent three years reading this book. I still don't understand fugacity. What I do know is that when they got an answer of 10 to 27th atmosphere, fugacity is a, is a concept similar to pressure, and it's like pressure in some circumstances and unlike pressure in other circumstances. When they figured it out and they got 10 to the 27th atmosphere, the trillion, trillion, trillion times the pressure at the center of the Earth, they should have said to themselves, we're misusing this equation. But instead, they decided they really were getting a pressure this great inside the electrode, which is sort of interesting because if you think about Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. You think if I could get a pressure that great, trillion, trillion, trillion times the pressure to send the earth, maybe it would explode or something. But they just thought what we're getting here is fusion. And they testified to this number in Congress. And it's wrong by 10 to the 23rd orders of magnitude. 
And a fellow from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory pointed out that lying about something in Congress that's wrong by 20 orders of magnitude is probably a record even for Congress. <laughs> <laughs> to which my comment is, if anyone would know about lying to Congress these days, it's scientists from Livermore. <laughs> um, if you want to figure out how much, what the pressure is inside a palladium lattice, the easiest way to do it is you stick the lattice in a canister and you pump deuterium gas into the canister, and when the deuterium gas is saturated, you can't pump any more, and it's saturated inside the palladium, you see what pressure you're pumping at. It happens to be 15,000 atmospheres, which is a lot, but it's not enough to induce nuclear fusion. Okay. So, what we have Two scientists again, 54 orders of magnitude away from everything we know about nuclear physics. They throw this press conference. That's the theoretical results, okay? And they give evidence for nuclear fusion, okay? They say they get a heat output of watts. That means they pump in a certain amount of energy into their cell. They've got it plugged into the wall, and it's going into the electrode and they're measuring the temperature coming out, the temperature of the cell, and they figure and they, they figure that they're getting so much heat out, they convert that to energy, and they show this chart in their paper. The generation of excess enthalpy in palladium rod cathodes expresses a percentage of break-even values. And people saw this chart, and they said, this is excess heating percentage of break-even. Break-even is that point where they're getting as much energy out of their cells as pumping into their cell. And they saw these numbers, 286% of break-even, 1224% of break-even. That's 12 times as much energy coming out of the cell that was going into the cell. This is eight times as much energy coming out of the cell as they were putting into the cell. And a lot of chemists who really cared about this thought, well, gosh, that's really impressive. You know, you put in this energy, and this is what you get out. And then they looked to try and figure out what these numbers actually meant the percentage of base break even based on total energy supplied to the cell and an electrode reaction D2 plus so many of the subpotential 0.5 volts. Does anyone understand what that means? Is there a chemist in the house? Nobody in America understood what that meant. What it turned out to mean, okay, they, these numbers convinced the world that cold fusion was real, at least the chemistry. What it turned out to mean that they never did the experiment. They calculated what would happen if they had a perfect cell. And the laws of thermodynamics didn't hold, and there was such a thing as a free lunch. And these were the numbers they would have got. And nobody knew this. People can't hear me. Okay. Anyway, nobody knew this. They even they testified in Congress a month later. People, they actually testified that they were hypothetical numbers, but they did it in such a way that no one would understand it. People at the University of Utah who backed these guys, like the dean of the School of Natural Science, who became the first head of the National Cold Fusionists, who didn't know that they never did the experiments on which they based their claim until four or five months afterwards, at which point he didn't believe the people who he told them. Um, one fellow named Lewis, a chemist at Caltech, figured this out. And he called a friend of his, Chuck Martin, who was at Texas A&M. And Chuck was a good friend of Sam Pons and Martin Fleischman. They was out playing basketball in Pasadena, shooting hoops when it struck him that this was a, what they were talking about, a hypothetical experiment. And he called Chuck Martin, and he said, Chuck, they didn't do the experiment. And Chuck said, what are you crazy? Of course they did. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're trying to replicate this. He said, they couldn't have done it. He said, we tried to do the experiment they described, and it's impossible. And he said, call Stan Pons and ask him if he did it. And Chuck called Stan Pons and he said, did you do the experiment? And he said, well, we did all the experiments. He said, yeah, but did you measure those numbers? And Stan hung up on him. I was in that. Okay, enough. The heat was the primary evidence for cold fusion for chemists. They also said they got tritium out of their cells. And if you fuse two deuterons, one of the major reactions should be you should get a lot of tritium out. In fact, you should get... Uh, Watts of heat, this is deuteron plus deuteron equals tritium, you get 
times 10 to the 12 tritium atoms. And they reported that they got 1 billion trillion atoms, 100 dpm per mil, which turned out to be less than the natural concentration of tritium in heavy water. Tritium is an even heavier form of hydrogen. Uh, they didn't realize this because this number here was so big that they thought they had discovered something. But when you buy heavy water from nuclear power plants, uh, they're in a nuclear power plant they sell, and they're contaminated with tritium. Uh, as much as 50 times more tritium is what Hans and Fleisch had discovered. They also said they got neutrons in. Another form of, uh, if you have two deuterons fused, you can get helium-3 plus a neutron, in which case for every watt of heat, you should get 2 times 10 to the 12 neutrons in per second, okay? And many scientists, 2 times 10 to the 12, that's 2 trillion neutrons per second. Excuse me, Mark. this rogue thinks it's slow. It's <laughs> good. Many scientists who heard they were claiming nuclear fusion and saw them on television said, but there's something wrong with these people. How could they be claiming nuclear fusion from the test tube? Because they're still alive. Because if you're getting, generating a trillion neutrons a second, that's lethal radiation. They said they were getting 40,000 neutrons a second. This was in their paper. They also said they had a detector efficiency of 0.0024. The way you measure neutrons is they have neutron detectors, which are kind of like Geiger counters from the old movies, except instead of rattling, they, 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 you know, they count how many neutrons. And when you figured out, people backtracked. They said they, they, said they got 40,000 neutrons a second, but they had an efficiency of, they were only seeing, they said, uh, 24 of every 10,000 neutrons that came out. And uh, so you, you figure that out. And what it meant is that they were seeing six neutrons a minute at the detector by the, by the cell. They took the detector and they put it by the cell and they counted six neutrons a second a minute. Then they took the detector to the other side of the room and they counted two neutrons a minute. Which, if you don't know anything about neutron detection, also might sound mildly interesting. But it turned out that the detector they used was sensitive to humidity and heat. And they take the detector and they put it by the cell, which is bubbling water up, and steam is coming out of it. And they would count six neutrons a second, and they would walk across the room where there was no steam, and they'd only count two. And what they were doing was no, the detector was noticing the fact that they were putting it over a boiling water. In any case, it should have detected one new, trillion neutrons per second, which should have killed them. So all this again is, this is their experimental evidence for cold fusion. The key evidence, as far as physicists were concerned, something called gamma rays. Okay, and let's see if we can find. Here we, we don't need that. They should be getting a trillion neutrons per second out, and each one of these neutrons, a lot of these neutrons, will interact with the water in this bath. And when they interact with the water, they'll interact with a hydrogen atom, and that'll give off a gamma ray. It always gives off a gamma ray of exactly the same energy, which happens to be 2.22 million electron volts. And a gamma ray is like a photon. It's a particle of light. It's very high energy. And they're all around us. There are gamma rays coming out of the glass and the light bulbs. There's gamma rays coming out of the concrete. There's a lot of elements in nature that are mildly radioactive and emit gamma rays. But if their cells emit gamma rays, it would emit neutrons, the neutrons would interact with the water, the water would emit, emit a gamma ray of 2.45 million electron volts, and this was like a fact of life. And Hans and Fleischmann knew this, it's actually 2.22 electron volts, and they put this chart in their paper, and this was figure one, and a lot of physicists saw this and said, well, there must be something to call fusion because they see gamma rays. And this was a, a peak, it's, it's, so the chart is saying this, they have another little detector like a Geiger counter, and it's picking up gamma rays and it's saying we see none at 2,000 million electron volts, uh, you know, none at 2,100, and we get to 2,000, 2,200, we start seeing, we, then we get a lot of them, you know, and then it goes a little lower, and this was very impressive. Physicists looked at this and they said, wow, they must be getting gamma rays. And then a few more said, wait a minute, that's not a gamma ray spectrum. It's an interesting peak, but it's not a gamma ray spectrum. And it turns out, if you talk to enough physicists who do this work, that this is a gamma ray spectrum. And that there are all these gamma rays, like I said, occurring all around us that are in naturally radioactive elements. Uh, let's see, potassium 40, which is in glass, 
So if you set up a detector in this room, and you get this spectrum, you can see gamma rays coming out of exactly this energy from the potassium 40. And then there's bismuth 214 and thallium 208, which is in concrete. You can see this little peak from thallium 208. So what happened is this fellow at MIT, Richard Petrasso, was this bright, young, kind of fiery Italian physicist. And Richard was devoted to gamma rays. He's obsessed with them. And he saw this original chart. And he said, well, if they see gamma rays, this is my business. I'm going to find out all about it. And he studied it. And he said, wait a minute, that's not a gamma ray. You know, this is, this is a gamma ray spectrum. So one of the things he did is he had a student look at the old tapes from TV at the Ponds and Fleischmann experiment when they had the press conference. And they noticed on the TV when they panned around the laboratory, there was a gamma ray spectrum on one of the TV monitors, a real one like this. So they got a hold of the videotapes and they blew it up. They looked at the gamma ray spectrum and they realized that where there should be a peak at 2.22 MeV, which is right here, if they were getting neutrons and gamma rays, there wasn't any. And then they did their own experiment where they actually put a little uh, neutron source inside a glass of water to prove that if there was this thing wasn't any neutrons, the way the detector was set up, they'd see it. And they wrote to Nature and they said, Hans and Fleischmann don't see gamma rays. And this is why. Hans and Fleischmann wrote back that Petrasso was a scoundrel. And they gave some evidence for gamma rays and still didn't show the spectrum. And uh, Trosser wrote back another letter to Nature, provoking them even more. And finally, Pons and Fleischmann wrote back one last time, and now they showed this spectrum. And they said, this is proof. This is the real spectrum. This is their spectrum. They really do see gamma rays. And here's a thallium, the potassium 40 peak. And they said, here's the peak for their gamma rays at 2.22 MeV. And this they identified as, I don't know what. And every physicist who looked at this said, these spikes here, this is what happens when you've got a bad gamma ray detector. And this is also not a good thing. These are noise from the amplifier. And by this time, the world had read this back and forth in nature, and it was pretty obvious. And in fact, I actually talked to the guy who did this work for Hans and Fleischmann. And he said, yeah, what happened was I had a bad gamma ray detector, but I never had the guts to tell Stan. <laughs> so, what you've got this slow progression. The theory that's 54 is a magnitude away from everything we know about nuclear physics. And no experimental evidence whatsoever. However, after they went public, after Hans Fleischmann claimed the discovery of this thing, which was essentially salvation, it was true. Nuclear fusion in a glass of water is limitless, inexhaustible, pollution free energy. Thousands of people started working on this experiment, tens of thousands, because anyone who could get a hold of a glass of heavy water on a palladium electrode, which got hard to find, but as soon as they went public, Palladium prices skyrocketed. Uh, that's all you need. Heavy water, palladium, some platinum. Thousands of people started doing this experiment. And within weeks, people started confirming it. Even though it was 54 orders of magnitude away from everything we know about nuclear physics, and Ponce Fleischmann had no evidence. On April 10th, this was a key. On April 10th, Charles Martin, a friend of Nate Lewis, the guy who called Stan, claimed that he had confirmed their detection of existing. Chuck Martin's a great character. His two best friends in physics and chemistry are Stan Pons in Utah and Nate Lewis in Caltech. And what he does, with cold fusion rays, he thinks it's that, you know, chemists, his profession can be at the forefront of the world. So he throws together an experiment. He hooks up with two of the best calorimetrists in the country. Calorimetry is the measure are people who actually measure heat in and out of experiments and chemistry experiments. And it's, it's an archaic art. There are about 10 people who do it in America. Hans and Fleischmann are not two of them. And he gets together with them. They put together a fail, foolproof method of measuring how much heat goes into the cell, how much energy goes in, and how much heat comes out. Now, 
And on Friday night, April 8th, they've been working for two weeks straight. Chuck was so paranoid about this, he wouldn't let the graduate students in the experiment. They washed all the dishes themselves. April 8th at night, you start seeing more heat coming out of the cells going into it. And they pull through the calendar. And he starts, he's supposed to go to a birthday party in Austin. Right now there's a conversation with Hexen. Gets in the car, he drives by halfway to the birthday party, can't stand it, turns around, goes back to the laboratory, triple checks the experiment. The next morning, they decide they're going to write a paper. They write a paper on Saturday, April 9th. They call the editor of the Journal of Electroanalytical Chemistry that night, and they mail it out to them. The next morning, Sunday morning, they're still getting excess heat. They've got a foolproof calorimeter, and they're seeing 80% more heat uh, energy coming out than they're putting into it. The next morning, Sunday morning, they track down the PR man at College Station, Texas, and they say, we've got to throw a press conference, because this is big. We've got the first confirmation of cold fusion. And they hear that there are other people getting ready to go public. Sunday afternoon, he calls up his buddy, Nate Lewis at Caltech, who's an excellent chemist and skeptic. And Nate says, Chuck, you guys run controls. And controls, you know, you Hans well, Fleischmann claimed that you got to, 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 to induce nuclear fusion, you take this stuff, heavy water, which is water with deuterium instead of hydrogen, you put it in with palladium. And, uh, you know, you need the heavy water, you need the palladium, and that's what gives the nuclear fusion. So one of, one of the things some people were saying was, well, you should do controls, you should run it with tap water. And if you don't get nuclear fusion with tap water, then maybe you've got something. But if you get what appears to be nuclear fusion with tap water also, then you know that you're just screwing up the experiment because there's no reason in the world you should never get nuclear fusion with plain tap water. So Nate asked Chuck, if you don't controls? And Chuck says, well, uh, no. It was his doing. Chuck says, but we got a press conference scheduled for 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And Nate says, do the experiment, do the controls. I'm going to wake up at, at 4 o'clock California time, so I can call you at 6 o'clock your time to find out what happened when we run the controls. So they run the controls, and they run it with light water. They haven't slept in 48 hours, and they get excess heat with light water, too. Exactly what they shouldn't get, they were using the perfusion. So Chuck Martin, who's now temporarily insane, doesn't call up his buddy Nate Lewis. He calls Stan Pons in Utah and says, Stan, Guess what? We run these cells and get heat in light water too. And Stan says, that's the big secret, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> we get fusion in light water also, but the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense won't let us go public with <laughs> If you this is you know, this is this is the weird thing is this really happened. And if you go public with this, this will be your contribution and your share of the world. Six in the morning, Nate Lewis calls. As he promised, if you do the controls, and Chuck says, yeah, they didn't work. What do you mean they didn't work? So they didn't work, and he hangs up. Eight o'clock, they throw the press conference. And they know, they don't talk about the light water, because he's, he's crazy, but he's not totally crazy. <laughs> they throw the press conference, and we confirm that Sam Hunt's on flesh, we get excess heat, and they go, he goes off, and now the graduate students finally get to touch the experiment. And the graduate students are smart guys, and they were thinking, fusion in light water. So they start running other controls. They say, another way to do it is if you need the palladium to induce the pressure on the electrodes, maybe we should try with the gold electrode. So they take out the palladium, they put in the gold, and they get excess heat. <laughs> they take out the gold, and they put in the carbon electrode, and they get excess heat. Within eight hours of going public, not only are they on every TV station, every radio station, every newspaper in the country, they know they were wrong. <laughs> Turns out that they had set, they were so careful in this foolproof calorimeter that they put in an extra thermometer. And this thermometer, a thermistor, they plugged it into the wall, it was electronic, and they plugged it in, they were getting like feedback from the thermometer. So they're actually feeding in 80% more energy into the cell through the thermometer, <laughs> but they didn't know it. And they were so excited, they had no sleep. But Chuck Martin convinced half the world that cold fusion was real. James Mahaffey, Georgia Tech Research Institute convinced a lot of the rest of the people. Uh, Georgia Tech Research Institute, everyone said Georgia Tech confirms cold fusion, but GTRI has nothing to do with Georgia Tech, even though they're like in the same city. Um, Mahaffey and his buddies were all nuclear engineers. When cold fusion broke, they got excited, like Chuck Martin got excited, they got the lady, they got heavy water, and they borrowed these old neutron detectors that were 20 years old and set them up. They set up an experiment 
where you take the cold fusion cell and you put the neutron detector over it, and then you got this paraffin bricks all around it in case you really is emitting neutrons, you won't get bombarded. And at three in the morning one morning, he gets a call that they're getting a neutron signal. And he goes in and he takes this, this old 20-year-old neutron detector and he puts it behind the paraffin blocks. I mean, it's sitting in front of the detector, ticking away like mad, like a Geiger camera. They put it behind the paraffin blocks, which will block the neutrons, and it stops. They put it in front of the cell, and it goes crazy, and they put it behind the blocks, and it stops. They show the people, they bring in the, the PR people from GTRI, the directors, they throw a press conference on every newspaper in the country, their phone system locks up with scientists calling them to find out how they did it. One of the calls is from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, my friends. They call and they start talking, they realize Livermore, GTRI did the exact same experiment. Exactly, the paraffin bricks, the neutron detectors. What Livermore did was when they took the neutron detector, put it behind the paraffin bricks, they took it in their hands. The GTRI was using such old neutron detectors, they were afraid of breaking them, they kind of picked them up daily by the cords and put them behind. The Livermore people realized that when they held on to the detector, it started firing, like it was detecting neutrons. When they took their hands away, it would stop firing. And they realized these old neutron detectors are not only uh, humidity sensitive, they're heat sensitive. So you put it in front of the cell with the water bubbling up and the boiling water, and it goes off, and you put it behind the paraffin bricks, and it stops going. Mahaffey realized two days after the press conference that he was screwed. When his colleague told him about this conversation with Livermore, his comment was, we're dead men. And they actually they threw a press conference to announce a retraction. And when they retracted, the uh, uh, Mahaffey told me it was like throwing a, hang, a hanging where you were the hangy. <laughs> um, curiously enough, I could go through all these. This is a good one. Van Eden at the... When Mahaffey was tracking those, the Wall Street Journal was covering cold fusion from the beginning. They thought it was their story, and they had missed out when ITC superconductors were discovered two years earlier, and the New York Times had covered it much better. So they wanted to cover cold fusion and do it best, and the Wall Street Journal was on it. And they had one reporter, Jerry Bishop, who was covering it faithfully and getting it all right. When these guys retracted, the retraction was a big story. Uh, in every other paper, but it was a half a paragraph at the end of the story about this fellow, Van Eden, and uh, his colleague, Lou, at the University of Washington, said they discovered tritium. These guys were graduate students who took a cell and they put it under a mass spectrometer. And a mass spectrometer takes the uh, atoms, they take the, the, the steam coming out and look through it and divide it up into you know, hydrogen, deuterium, helium, you know, atoms that have at an atomic mass of one, of two, of three, of four, of five, you know. And they saw atoms with atomic mass of five and six, which they figured had to be deuterium, which is a proton and a neutron, and tritium, which has, has would be a, 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 three deuterium, uh, uh, six would be uh, tritium and tritium, and five would be tritium and deuterium. And they went public and it got the Wall Street Journal, the headline was graduate students go and missing puzzle. Within an hour after they went public, the computer networks were full of physicists sending messages to the University of Washington saying, oh my god, these grad students screwed up. What they found was not deuterium and tritium and tritium and tritium, but deuterium, 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 and hydrogen. But because the, the Wall Street Journal was biased and wanted to believe in cold fusion, the fact that somebody was retracting the discovery that they had made two days earlier and claiming that they hadn't confirmed cold fusion no story, the fact that some two graduates at the University of Washington had prematurely claimed confirmation was a story. And it, it went on like this. What happened? You had like 10,000 people trying this experiment. And out of those 10,000, there were a handful of people who were bad enough to get it wrong. Robert Huggins <laughs> was a very prestigious material scientist at Stanford University. Was the key word. Now, I hate that people, some people criticize my books because they say I talk too candidly about scientists, but scientists are human, and like humans, I mean, you scientists are believe this. Um, sorry. Anyway, they, they come in all different shapes and sizes and talents, and some are great, and some are not so great, and some are having personal problems, and like the rest of us with personal problems, they don't do a good job. Huggins was a very prestigious material researcher who 
career has fallen apart. He had been divorced. His famous father, who almost won a Nobel Prize, had recently died. He had gone from having a laboratory with a dozen postdocs and grad students to having a laboratory with none. And he saw cold fusion with salvation, and he jumped on it. And he was going to do the comparison of the high of the physicists that people said, you got to do those controls, high water, heavy water, and tap water. And this was going to be his contribution to cold fusion. He ran a heavy water cell and a tap water cell. And the heavy water cell ran hotter than the tap water cell. And he threw a press conference. And he also called it funding agents the very same day to show them. What he didn't know was that heavy water and light water are chemically different. Heavy water has a higher resistivity, or a lower conductivity, than light water. So if you run the same electric current through heavy water, it heats up more than that same current through light water. Huggins was an interesting case because he convinced the people in Utah that he was right. He also, Stanford put in patent applications convincing the University of Utah that they were trying to steal it from. And uh, every time somebody showed him what was wrong with his experiment, he'd show him a month later at the next conference. Still claiming confirmation, showing virtually the same transparency but having a different experiment which some of the more skeptical members of the press said, you never change the experiment. The results stay the same. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these. Each one of these stories, each one of these confirmations is another example of very bad science of some sort or another. Uh, this was a Italian researcher who didn't know about the fact that neutron detectors were sensitive to heat and humidity. This was a couple of octogenarians at the University of Florida who didn't know about an uh, effect called chemioluminescence that happens when you look for tritium detectors. This we won't bother with. Appleby was a fellow, an opportunist at Texas a and who had a very good reputation in chemistry, who basically did, I mean, I can't even explain that at all. So we did. Appleby's experiment was pathetic. The level of like sophomores in high school doing cold fusion, and then he claimed it was cold fusion. He was in Bacchus, had a graduate student who was putting tritium in the cells, tritiated water, pouring it into the cells, and then measuring it the next day and saying, We've discovered tritium. <laughs> <laughs> uh, storms and Talcott, Ed Storms. Ed Storms is a wonderful story. Ed Storms looked like Charlton Heston and Moses. He had worked on the nuclear fusion program at the uh, nuclear uh, rocket program at Los Alamos and decided when cold fusion hit that he would do it. And I mean, this guy is a tall, beautiful hair. He, he looks like he's backlit all the time. His <laughs> eyes are <glowing. laughs> And he said, he told me that cold fusion was, would be a great discovery, but he was wrong. <laughs> and that's why they were going to work on it. And they did this experiment where they took, they bought, paraffin from the local supermarket. They decided the way to test cold fusion was you had to load up the, the, the palladium with as much deuterium as possible. And the way to do that was to poison it with some other chemicals. Sulfur was what they were interested in. Because there were some papers saying you could load more deuterium if you use sulfur. So they bought put wax from the local supermarket. They filled it with, they poured, melted it, poured sulfur into it, dipped the palladium electrode into it, let it dry and then stuck it in the cell and tried to run it and found out that you can't absorb any deuterium into a palladium electrode when you've got wax covering it. <laughs> so they discharged the, they, they ran the current the other way to break the uh, wax off. They let it flow through the bottom and then they ran it for 10 days and then they poured out the water and the wax and they filled it up with new water and then they measured and saw that they had like eight times the amount of tritium that they expected. And they went public with this. They never ran any controls. They never checked to see if maybe the paraffin had tritium in it after all in Los Alamos, the nuclear weapons laboratory. Um, big story in the Wall Street Journal. Now, while this was going on, these people were confirming that Hans and Fleischmann were collaborating with people against their will when they were doing it. Um, they, they were trying to get General Electric to finance their research in Utah to buy them fusion. General Electric said they'd do it if they let the General Electric chemists check the cells and see if they're really getting out excess heat. By now, this is like July, and Hans Fleischmann claiming 15% excess heat. 
So the General Electric chemists come to Utah and they pick up a cell, and one of them flies back in a commercial airliner with the cell gingerly between his legs, and they're afraid to tell anyone that they've got a potential hydrogen bomb on the plane. <laughs> and they take it back to Schenectady, and they test it, and this is the result. Like, I just put this down, because this showed you the state of mind in Utah. Hugo Rossi was a dean, he was a very good mathematician, was a dean of the College of Arts and Science at Utah, became the first director of the National Cold Fusion Institute. He was a very bright man who I actually think is one of the heroes of this story. Had to report to the Utah State Legislature on what General Electric found. And in order for the Utah Legislature to let go of $5 million that they were thinking of uh, giving to Cold Fusion, they did. And so he wrote, Scientists of General Electric, after long and careful study, some of it here with Pons in his laboratory, conclude that the basic calorimetric theory of Pons and Fleischmann is correct and shows excess energy. Parentheses, they have some concerns about the accuracy of the calibration and made a correction of their own preparation of the data. This correction, amounting to 15%, F and P data shows significant excess energy. They have re reproduced the experiment in Schenectady and obtained energy at about the 15% level, thus indistinguishable from zero with their correction. Which means, for Hugo aside, that the guys at Schenectady studied the calorimetry techniques that Pons and Fleischer were using to determine if they had excess energy, and they found that they were off by 15%. Pons and Fleischer were measuring 15, were claiming they had now 15% excess heat. And so if you figure they were off by 15%, they're claiming 15%, basically their cells were in perfect balance. Okay? Hugo had trouble saying this because he was so bound up with this thing, and he was so caught up in it, and he had to give the Utah State Legislature a glowing recommendation to get the five million. And when I pointed this out to him a little while later, he said, oh, I guess that wasn't my finest hour. <laughs> anyway, so they, they collaborate with General Electric to see if they're really getting excess heat out of their cells, and they're not. Meanwhile, Hugo forced them to take micro solid detectors, neutron detectors. He comes out and he finds absolutely nothing. The cells are making nothing and Hans told the press, well, of course they were making nothing. We were running at a special level, really low, so that they wouldn't have been anything. Um, Hugo forced Hans and Fleisch to collaborate with the Pacific Northwest Laboratories to do a study looking for helium. By now, they were given up on everything else. They were claiming that maybe they were coming up helium. I won't go into the details, which are kind of sorted. Um, they got nothing. Okay? So the cells weren't emitting excess heat, they weren't emitting neutrons and gamma rays, they weren't emitting helium, they weren't doing anything. Hans and Fleischmann did not renounce their belief in cold fusion, however, they renounced their belief in collaboration. <coughs> this is one of my favorite charts. When they went public, March 23, 1989, they claimed 1,200% excess heat. Uh, by July 89, it was down to about 15 percent, and now there's so few people doing it, it's been it's about 10 percent, and you can see that that's what mathematicians would call asymptotically approaching zero. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing is calorimetry really, it's a very rough art, and you can only measure about 10 percent accuracy. So what people are claiming is the very limits of what they can possibly detect. They're really careful. And what they're also expected to believe, those people who still believe in cold fusion, is that nature bridged this gap, 54 orders of magnitude from what we know of Nobel nuclear physics. This gap that's bigger than the distance between a proton and the size of the universe, and gave us an effect that's just barely visible. It really look hard. <laughs> 10 times smaller, 53 orders of magnitude, you'd never see it. 10 times greater, and there wouldn't have been any hullabaloo. They'd be in Stockholm already. Um, this actually, uh, this goes for a lot of science. You know, this really is a controversy now about electromagnetic fields, whether or not they cause cancer. Probably read. There's a book out there by a New Yorker writer called The Great Power Line to cover the power of our utility company are covering up the fact that we're getting cancer from being around things like this. And it's the same kind of thing. The power consumption in America has increased 300 fold since the turn of the century, but the cancer rates haven't changed. Okay, the, the power, the, the electromagnetic field levels we're talking about are 1 20th the size of the electromagnetic field that we're in right now from the Earth's magnetic field, 
But yet, if you read these books, they argue that they create just the sort of cancer. That if you use really high-powered epidemiological techniques, you might almost see it. And we should pay our utility companies two million dollars to bury the line. But there's also a reason to find that. It's what I call hard. I'm now getting back, wandering back to explain why 300 people are still doing the good deed and everyone is going crazy. This is what I call hard conjecture. Alan Barr, who's a great chemist at the University of Texas, is a great chemist. It was on a part of the panel. They went around to all the laboratories and looked at all the experiments, Hans and Fleischmann, Huggins, Los Alamos, Texas a and came back incredibly depressed. I can't believe the quality of these experiments that people are calling science. And he pointed out to me that statistics apply to science as well as the experiments as well as the scientists. That if you imagine 10,000 scientists jump off the cold feet of the bandwagon. And they can all do these experiments that are so cheap. You know, when my buddy Carlo Rubio from Nobel Dreams claimed he had discovered particles with his accelerator that didn't exist, he was using a $200 million accelerator and $40 million experiment, so there weren't a lot of people who could jump on the bandwagon. But with cold feet of 2,000 bucks, if 10,000 scientists do it, and they fall on a Gaussian distribution, you know, the bell shape curve, okay, like IQ. There's some good scientists and some bad scientists and a great mass of average scientists. Now you assume that, say, 9,800 of them do it right, which is probably optimistic, or 200 of them, statistically speaking, would be expected to do it wrong. And these would be the octogenarians, like Chessel and Wessing at the University of Florida, you know, those desperate to regain their lost years, like the Huggins and Stanford, you know, a few frauds, a few cheats, a few people who just deluded themselves, like Chuck Martin. Um, basically, the dregs of science, the power of distribution, the link. They're all going to fall one side of the distribution. And this is basically infinite. There's always going to be a scientist out there, a graduate student, who's going to say, even 50 years from now, I'll look at his book. I think I'll try it. I'll set it up and I'll run it and I'll get excess heat out or a neutron detector and start rattling. And instead of thinking, how am I I have screwed up, which is what most scientists will think as soon as God grants them what looks like a discovery was probably the, you know, the end of their reputation, this student will think, my God, I've discovered cold fusion. So what you have in Japan at that conference is the tail of the distribution. He said, you've got the world tail instead of just the American tail. And it sounds very cool to say that if you met these people, which I had the dubious honor of doing, it's, it's, it's truly depressing. I mean, some of these people are out there teaching students. A couple more. Iotas. This is something called uh, the wager of Blaise Pascal, which is the overriding philosophy of cold fusion. Um, there's also a few typos in this, that, and invariably some physicist points out to me. I apologize for kind of demonstrating it. Um, Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician, theologian of the 17th century, I think, who actually left science to go into theology. In his wonderful book, Francais, he puts forth the wager, which is why I should believe in God, any man in the world. And it basically goes, let us weigh up the gain and the loss that's involved in calling heads that God exists. Let us assess the two cases. If you win, you win everything. If you lose, you lose nothing. Do not hesitate to think that he doesn't exist. But Pascal's argument is if you believe in God and God exists, your reward is an infinity of happy lives or an infinite of infinite happy lives. And if you believe God exists and he doesn't, the risk is one lifetime. You've been a fool for one lifetime. So anytime that you're betting the finite odds, Finite risk against an infinite benefit, people will take that bet. When the University of Utah was deciding whether to go public or not, they said if cold fusion is real, it's worth trillions of dollars. The wealth of OPEC. How can we afford not to claim this discovery for our state? What if it's, let's say, the odds of it being right are one in a hundred, 
Well, it's one in a hundred versus trillion dollar payout. What if the odds are one in a thousand? Steve Kuhn is a great nuclear physicist at Caltech who's trying to decide whether to shoot down a cold fusion in the American Physical Society meeting, whether to do it strongly. And he actually he did. He went up and said that cold fusion was due to the incompetence and delusion of Hans Fleischmann. But before he did it, he said, you know, I was thinking to myself, I'm 99.99% .99 sure it's baloney. Well, if he's in Utah, 99.99% .99 sure is still what weighed against a trillion dollar payoff. I mean, if we went out to play the lottery, and somebody said, you could bet, you know, the odds are 9,999 to 1 against, you could pay a billion dollars, you could sell your house and buy 9,999 lottery tickets, because you're going to get paid a billion dollars. A very persuasive philosophy. Even the Japanese now are investing $25 million in cold fusion and saying we have we need an energy source, we have no oil, we're landlocked, fusion is <coughs> great. It's probably wrong, but what if it's right? Uh, every, I think every scientist made this decision in his head, real public. It's probably you, know, you throw together an experiment, you do it. All you're risking is your reputation. And the payoff if it's real is Pascal's way to the house, translation. Does God exist? If yes, infinite, if no, finite. This is the uh, <coughs> application form for the Fourth International Conference <laughs> on Cold Fusion. It takes place December 6th to 9th in Bali, uh, in, uh, in Hawaii. Weather's nice, $400. There'll be people there that you will regret having met. No time to speak. Anyway, that's it. That's my uh um, it's convincing to me. I mean this has been, you know, the nuclear physics we're talking about, I mean it works. You you look at at, at something called neuron catalyzed fusion, which takes place in liquid hydrogen or whatever, minus seven seven kilowatts. Minus seven seven kilowatts, three seven seven kilowatts. Yeah. Very cold. And you know, you can make models of the sun or models of supernova based on everything you know about nuclear fusion. At 100 million degrees, it works. To think that this level of cold fusion, I mean, New York catalyzed fusion, which is all the type of cold fusion, has also been studied by people a lot smarter than I am. And uh, there are basic quantum physics reasons to believe that it'll never be efficient as an energy source, let alone the glass of water. Basic quantum physics. Um, I doubt. Not at all. I mean, it's not as though you, when you're saying, okay, new, Newtonian gravitation okay. has been dropped and has become Einsteinian gravitation, but in the process, it doesn't help us jump more than two feet in the air. We're still bound by the, the F equals m a over whatever r squared. Whatever. It is. I mean, it'll change, but it'll absorb everything we know now. It won't change what we know. Maybe, maybe not. I've got some swamp land in New Jersey. And this is this is my favorite part of the story. I was living in Los Angeles when this broke. My publisher, the random man, called me up and they said, You want to do cold fusion? It's controversial, it's a big story, it's like Nobel Games. I said, sure, it takes nine months, it's the bank most of the advance, writes the screenplay, then move back to Paris. I had to so it doesn't take me nine months, it takes me three years. The bank is dad loans me tens of thousands of dollars. And when it's over, Hans and Fleischmann are living in France, being funded by a French company that owns the French subsidiary of Toyota that makes mufflers for French Toyota. And Hans is supposed to be very happy and sons are learning French. I mean, there's a moral here, I haven't figured it out. <laughs> yes. I uh, I had several like ten minute conversations with Fleischmann. Uh, Khan's part of the story, which you'll know if you read the book, which you should, really, it's about the job I did tonight. Um, Khan's very paranoid, and his best friend in the world is his lawyer, who's an ambulance patient in North Carolina. <laughs> and as soon as, it, unless I promise to believe in cold fusion, they wouldn't talk to me. As soon as they established that I didn't believe in cold fusion, all I got were letters from their lawyers threatening lawsuits. 
to really interest me. He would threaten to sue me if I talked to his clients. And he would threaten to sue me if I left anything out of the book that I might not have known because I didn't talk to his clients. Um, we're still waiting for the sue him. About how much money uh, is being spent annually on gold fusion? Well, all I know now is that the Japanese are spending about three to five million a year. Every the Electric Power Research Institute is spending an anthracite tax dollar away, uh, around three million a year. And I heard that Los Alamos is still spending a couple hundred thousand to contribute. Uh, the other estimate that I think get into is. Uh, estimated that $50 million was spent in America trying to confront gold fusion. And probably double that worldwide. Do you think maybe $100 million? I'm going to go back to your question. I, I, I gave you a kind of uh, the rude comment. Why, the reason I don't think I'll ever be real is I know why the Hunter Price went public. Uh, that's also in the book. It's another lecture. It's a very powerful one. I know what they knew when they were in public, and I know that, like I said, there were 50 quarters of magnitude away from nuclear physics, which may or may not change. I would bet on it. And they had no data. So what I do is I take them out of the equation, and I can explain the entire sociology of cold fusion, why it happened. I know why it happened. And I know that they, you know, had they not made this horrendous mistake, they in essence ruined their life, even though they didn't France, I would not be here and we would not be asking the question of whether or not gold fusion exists. It would never cross our mind. Because it's just it's as though they made this horrible mistake. It's, I mean, I've had people ask me, well, sure, EMP could exist. Sure, you know, both could exist. You can get anything into mythology of the culture. But once it does, as long as you assume that anything's possible, then anything's possible. But if it had not entered into mythology of the culture because of this grievous error that was perpetrated, it never would have crossed their mind. And even had it crossed somebody's mind, they would have looked at it and said, I mean, to me, 50 quarters of magnitude is as good a definition of functionally possible as we'll get. I have to. That saved my career. Just like Tom and Slice, I won't rule it out that they could be wrong if I'm Once it broke, uh, reporters started, A, they were a little gullible to begin with, but the press was never in a position to write that the big discovery that claimed the University of Utah's hogwash. Although one time, this fellow who shows up in cold fusion announced the discovery so in that the LA Times headline was, new discovery should be taken with grain of salt. And that, I think, because this fellow from Texas A&M told the LA Times reporter that he had to trust him when he asked the question. And you tell somebody who lives near Hollywood, trust me. And this is the kind of fun. <laughs> but what happens, all these people go public. And as the Wall Street Journal was covering it, because money was a motivating factor for a lot of people, being written up in the Wall Street Journal was, you know, so-and-so from Caltech said it's hogwash, but the Wall Street Journal says it's real. That meant a lot to people. And the Wall Street Journal reporter got into this mindset where anybody who came public and said it was hogwash, you know, Caltech did, MIT did, uh, 9,900 scientists did, but they quickly became no news. You know, another prestigious school says it's hogwash, so what? But any one of the 100 who came forward and said it was real was news. So these are the graduate students from the University of Washington get into the Wall Street Journal. I mean, today, you guys could do an experiment, claim that cold fusion was real afterwards, and I think it's a 50-50 shot to get into the Wall Street Journal. So anyone who had a positive result, no matter what their background was, what their reputation was, what their credit, I mean, there was a guy from Colorado State School of Mines and Engineering, Wall Street Journal. You know, um, it, 
So it's a case of self-perpetuating. Now what happens is journalists have to be unbiased. For instance, I'm a contributing correspondent for science. I'm not allowed to write about cold fusion anymore because I've established a point of view. I'm also the world's leading expert. So because I think it's hogwash with reason, I can't write about it. What you'll see is somebody will do an article. There's a lot of articles. After it dies, the only article you can do are of the It's Not Dead Yet variety. You know, see the cover of popular science. This is cold fusion. It's not dead yet. Now, quote four people who think it's hogwash, and they'll quote four believers who think it's real and there's been a conspiracy of the establishment to suppress it. And to the lay public, four of one and four of the other, it's obviously a coin toss, and they can spend 30 million dollars more in Congress to get it hashed out. What nobody, you know, the public doesn't see is that the four cynics come from 99.99% of the scientific community, and the four believers come out of 90 people. So there's this constant imbalance that still goes on and keeps it alive. And there's this, another effect of journalism, which is journalists can only do stories where you know man bites dog, dog bites man is no story. So first you see cold fusion stories, then you see the cold fusion is dead stories, then you see the cold fusion is not dead yet stories, then you can write cold fusion is dead after all stories. You see the same thing again a lot of social phenomena. Kennedy assassination. Three years ago, if you looked on the bookstores, you would say, every, of course there's a conspiracy, of course there was five gunmen, because every book in the bookstore was a conspiracy. Because the people who had written books 10 years ago and the reporters who had looked at it and said, well, there wasn't a conspiracy, they can't write books. You know, nobody's going to buy them. So you see, first, he's dead, there's no conspiracy, maybe there's a conspiracy, there's no, finally you get to the town of the distribution where the only books left are conspiracy books. Those are the only people who get their books published, and Oliver Stone takes that to new heights. And then you get a book out two years later that says there's no conspiracy after all. Case closed, and it's a bestseller for now. Because now you can write they said no conspiracy books. It's sort of it's it's like a natural system. First you get a peak and then it goes down and it just oscillates until, you know, if you if you're optimistic you think until it dies away, if you're pessimistic, it'll be there forever. I notice you make a number of strong statements about it a lot of people. I'm curious about any legal difficulties you have as a consequence. Um, the legal reading is a long drawn out. Um, it was the debate is are these people public figures? You know, is a graduate student in spite to sell in Texas A and M before it's fitting into a bottle of public figure? Uh, is Jan Rafelski, a physicist at the University of Arizona, who I spent a page demolishing a public figure. And the answer is in a public controversy. <coughs> the law seems to be in a public controversy that anyone involved is a public figure. So the definition of uh, libel as a public figure is you know, malice, which is knowledge of falsehood or total disregard for the truth. So basically, as long as I did the reporting, it was pretty safe. The publisher doesn't want to get any money. I mean, they will pay my legal, they'll pay the legal fees, but they don't, even, they don't even want to get anyone to win. Although the editor is saying, well, if we get anyone, we've got a best <laughs> um, <laughs> So far, I've had my legal problems. I don't expect, there are a few people I thought might be interested in suing me because they wouldn't think that they should be ignorant of character anyway less than complimentary. But in virtually every case it's better. People, even people who might think they have reason to if they have found friends, their friends have been to let it die. You can't read that book anyway. You still want so many people have been reason. But basically as long as reporting is sound. Um, and in one case, like there's a fellow Greg Young who plays a crucial role, Steve Jones, who's a very devout seer. Mormon scientist who comes across like Father Mulcahy, man. He looks like Father Mulcahy, he talks like Father Mulcahy, he says things like, I believe in the golden rule. It's too good to be true, which is what happened. And he had a collaborator, a guy named Jan Rafelski, the physicist at the University of Arizona, who had the worst reputation of any scientist I've ever come across. 
I'd call people up and they would normally find me very reticent to say bad things about colleagues and people would just jump down. And I couldn't understand. Rafelsky was important because he was involved with Jones who was important and they all had input in forcing the post location thing to happen. And I spent two months on Jan Rafelsky just trying to get enough understanding to talk to enough people. I talked to Leonid Konomarov about it, who's a Soviet theorist, and I called him up. Um, I tracked down a fellow named Jahan, who's uh, named Kurt Baron, who's a Duke, who's a very distinguished physicist, who collaborated with him. I think it was the fellow advisor and graduate school had written a dozen papers for him. And I got to the point where I called Mueller and I said, uh, I said, Mueller, I have a problem. I have to write a book about cold fusion, and I have to talk about John Rafelsky, and I can't get anyone to say anything good about it. This is how I introduced myself. And the other said, yeah, I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so after talking to, say, 30 scientists, all on one person, who I think played a crucial role, however small, I can say what I wanted to say, and I think, I don't, you know, it was not the least convinced around the country. Uh, a lot of one of the reasons my the book took so much longer than it did is because each character I ran into who turned out to be complex and not as, as wonderful as I would have hoped would add another month or two months to the book of research just so I could support that aspect of the story. Funding gets tighter and tighter. People are going to be more tempted to go public and not do the checks and not be as careful as they should be. And I think every graduate student, self-interest, conflict of interest here, I think every student who goes into any experimental subject should be forced to read this book. <laughs> you should buy it at the cover price. <laughs> no, but this, this, this is what I mean. We all would like this. this your quintessential get rich quick scheme. I mean, Hans and Fleischer, a couple of guys like, I now seen the victims actually. If you understand what happened, I think there were victims in a sense, but there were victims in the way somebody was conned by a con man as a victim. And the con man will say, You can't con an honest man, they have to have greed in their heart. And Hans and Fleischer and Tom particularly had greed in his heart, and he wanted it too badly. And, you know, most of us, I think, if somebody comes along and offers us, the Hope Diamond, you know, under the coat, we're just going to assume it's fake. And the danger of, you know, hawking your family jewels and selling the house and living your, yeah, you just, they have to be skeptical, especially in science, all these things are discovered. And they have to be aware of, you know, Well, thank you. Very good.